pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, awaiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is a Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God endures forever. Amen. Please be seated. We come to this wonderful story in the Gospel of John as it records Jesus' interaction with this man. And why does John include this account? It is in this account that we are reminded that Jesus is Lord, that he has divine authority over the body and over the soul. And we think of this man who had need both in his body and in his soul. And how Jesus addresses both of those. We might say the more obvious is his physical need. He was very much aware of that, having lived with it for 38 years. But did he recognize the need that he had in his soul? Did he know the reality of sin in himself? Jesus addresses this as well as the circumstance of his body. And we look at that, that we might see that Jesus is not only a savior, a healer, but that he is to be Lord, ruler, of our hearts, of our lives. And it sounds so simple, and yet there are many who are happy to have Jesus as their Savior, to give them the things they want, to fix things in their lives, only for them to live any way they please without any further thought of Jesus. And this is challenged in our text, and you, through this text, are challenged in that today. We look at our text and we see how there is first the highlighting of a need, or of need even in general, and that Jesus then has a cure for that need, but then also there is, we might say, that double cure for body and soul. We want to look at that and unfold that as we see it in our text. Now, first of all, there is need. And here is a concentration of need. After this, after Jesus had healed this nobleman's son, he was in Galilee, and now he, he comes down again. There was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And so Jesus and many others would go for this feast. 
that it would seem was probably a Passover. And Jesus goes on. And John draws our attention to this area where there is great need. It was in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, a pool. Jerusalem had different gates in the walls, and one was called the Sheep Gate, no doubt because sheep were ushered in through it for the sacrifices. And there was a pool which in Hebrew is called Bethesda, having five porches. And what do we find there? We find great need, a great multitude of sick people. Here a general term for, for those who knew any kind of infirmity. And they gathered there, and then a greater specificity, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Do we have a sense of, of how desperate a circumstance these people would be in? <clears throat> we think we have these infirmities in our culture, in our society as well. And there are resources available to them. We think of those who are blind and the help in seeing eye dogs and other resources available that they can live a life. We, we think of those who would be lame, and we think even of those who are, are given a prosthetic, a, a, an extension of their leg that has been lost and, and able to do wondrous things. But we think of that day, and there were not the same social networks, the care, the attention paid to those who were blind, who were lame, who were paralyzed. And they had to beg for money. And this is why, particularly at the feast, you would have many who came because there would be many people who come to Jerusalem and they would plead with them, give me something. Unable to work unable to provide for themselves, they would be at the mercy of others. And here is that need that is highlighted, that is intensified. Why? Why was someone blind? Why were they lame? Why were they paralyzed? The reality of sin in the world that brings about suffering that brings about the sorrow, that brings about those handicaps that we read about here. Was it particularly because one person had sinned that therefore they received a specific judgment? And we know that that is not the way Scripture presents. The effects of sin are everywhere. And these people knew the expression of the judgment of God against sin in these ways not necessarily because of a specific sin that they had committed. We'll see later, Jesus is addressing this more particularly in John chapter um, 9, when Jesus asks that specific question. But here we note the suffering of many, a multitude, and they were all gathered there, and, and you think this would be a depressing place to go, and yet Jesus goes. He goes to this place. And John shows that he has a focus. A particular man. A certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. And here, what particularly was it? The same general term that is used first of a multitude of sick people infirmed. We know that he was paralyzed For further in the text. But here's a man who had endured this year after year. 38 years he had been unable to do more than to, to, to crawl along, to hobble along, to, to, 
sort of get around and yet this great infirmity that would keep him from, from working, from enjoying life. And for 38 years, he had known this. We're not told when this developed, whether it was from an accident, a disease, or what, but you think he would have known the majority of his life this disability, this dependence on others, as he would have to beg for help. And we can all think of our own infirmities, the hindrances that we have. Did this man sometimes get impatient? And ask God, why? Why do I have to suffer like this? And he could only lie there and beg and, and hope, hope almost against hope that this place where there was a pool, where it was believed that where the water was troubled is, is the more exact translation, when it was stirred up, when there was movement that if he could but get into the water, he would be cured. And this is why he was there. <laughs> How long he had lain there, we don't know. Had he come with others? Is he a resident of Jerusalem? Again, we're not told, but here he was at this place where there were the porches that would give him some relief from the hot sun at least. And, and he would wait and hope and, and see if he could keep an eye on the water, and if it was moving, if it was being stirred, if it was being troubled, to try to get in there, that he might be cured. This is a situation that Jesus comes to. Very aware that he is in the midst of much suffering, of much sorrow, and of this man who has not experienced this for a few weeks, a few years, but for 38 years. And how no, no doubt he was despairing of ever becoming well, gaining his health and strength again. Jesus saw him and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. Had somebody pointed out to him? Did he know as the sovereign son of God? Again, the text doesn't tell us, but, but Jesus knew. And he asked him almost what seems to be a strange question. Do you want to be made well? You think, what kind of question is that to ask a man who's been paralyzed for 38 years, who was there by the pool? who was hoping that maybe he could get in and be cured. And Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? It almost seems strange, insulting, but Jesus has a purpose. He is drawing the attention of this man to his very hopeless condition. He is highlighting his need. And this man would think, 38 years I have been suffering in this way. <laughs> and it was a reminder. There had been no help. He had found no help, no cure anywhere. And here he was hoping for a miracle to get into the water, but what chance of that? did he have? And this is what he focuses on. Does he want to be made well? He answers says, well, of course I do. That's, that's why I'm here. But he doesn't say that he, he, there's this hindrance. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. You can imagine that if there was any movement in the water. Everybody was laying there. were trying to rush in. This is what they believed. Whether that was actually what happened or not, again, the text doesn't tell us. 
verse 4, we find in many translations, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had, we don't find in the oldest texts of the Old Test or the New Testament of this gospel in John. So it may have been put in as an explanation of what people believed. We're not certain, but we know that this was the desire. This was the belief. This is why that man was there. But he had no one else to carry him, to rush him down and get him into the water. And this is the hindrance, and somebody else always was there before him. Everybody was waiting for that. And so he is presenting a helpless circumstance to Jesus. He acknowledges he can't do it. It's something he has lived with for decades. And continues but but now Jesus having highlighted his need shows his divine power this man had no hope of cure from the doctors he had no hope of of getting into this water and, and thinking maybe there would be a miracle and it is in that as he is forced to reflect on his absolute need, his absolute helplessness, that Jesus then gives him this simple command. Rise! Take up your bed and walk. Notice the simplicity of it. There's no great preparation. Let's get a great crowd. Let's get them excited. Let's get them thinking something might happen. Jesus needs none of that. Here is the simplicity of the power of the Son of God. He tells this man, who can only drag himself along, rise, take up your bed, and walk. To stand up with strength, able to pick up your bed, to walk, to go, because you're not going to be coming back here. Don't leave your bed here. You're not coming back. You are cured. It's not going to be, well, I managed to walk five steps and I'll have to fall back on my mat again. Take up your bed and, and go. Walk. You won't be coming back. And what happens? This man, who for 38 years had not been able to do this, is cured simply, absolutely. He stands up. He picks up his bed and he goes his way, listening to the command of Jesus. And the disciples who saw this must have been astounded. To see the power of Jesus. And here is the mercy. The mercy of Jesus. Who felt compassion on this man. Who had suffered for 38 years. It was clear that there was no hope from men. It was clear that there was no hope for this man to somehow overcome it by himself. But Jesus comes and with a word gives that cure. Jesus gave hope, life, to a man who had essentially given up on life. Now, if the story had ended there, we might say, well, look at the demonstration of the power of Jesus. A divine power able to heal the body with a word. But notice the story doesn't stop there. It continues, and we'll continue past what we read because there is a development. Again, John picks these signs because they are the further revelation of the ministry of Jesus. 
And so Jesus has demonstrated that he has the authority, the power, to heal a body. But you see, people are body and soul. And a person may be hearty and hale, as we might say, and yet sin sick. Having sin in their hearts that would condemn them, though their body be healthy. And this man is walking, no doubt, he is rejoicing. He is doing something he hasn't been able to do for almost four decades. He is walking, and he knows his strength, and he's able to carry his mass as he's been commanded. And, and suddenly he runs into some Jews. And they look at him, and they're ready to point their finger at him. And what do they say? What are you doing? It's not lawful for you to carry your mat on the Sabbath because it is a Sabbath. Now we look in the scripture and we say, well, where did that command come from? And they might point back to Nehemiah chapter 13 where there were people who were carrying burdens on the Sabbath. Because they were working, they were threshing out the grain, and they would carry the grain, or they would carry what they had bought in the marketplace, and they were engaged in commerce. And Nehemiah says, no, that is wrong. This is the Lord's day, it is a day of worship. And you are not to be carrying your burdens, the result from your labors. But the Jews had somehow developed this into carrying anything on the Sabbath. And so they accuse this man of breaking the Sabbath. And they have a question to him then. Why? It is not lawful for you. Now, notice the man's answer. He who made me well gave me this command. What, what is implied in there? Well, you're telling me this, but the man who made me well, who obviously had shown a divine power, told me this. So who was he going to listen to? <laughs> he was going to listen to Jesus' command. And he thinks this should be a defense. This should settle the matter. A man who can, after 38 years, make me whole and walk. Does he not have the authority to tell me what to do? And if he tells me to carry this mat, I will listen to him. But they are not satisfied with that. And no doubt they warned him sternly. And they want to know, who was it that encouraged you to break our law? Now the man didn't know, and it almost seems a little odd to us, that he didn't go back to find Jesus. But we were told that there was a multitude there, and Jesus just slipped away. He wasn't looking to have that focus. And perhaps the man did go back and, and couldn't find Jesus. There is a whole crowd. Everybody was there and they were seeking to engage people and begging and asking for money. And so he didn't know where Jesus was. He didn't know his name. But what we do see of this man who was cured, where does he go? Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. And what is done in the temple? The worship of God. This man went to the temple to give thanks to God for his healing. He saw that this was a kindness. And Jesus now finds him there. And here's where Jesus is interested in that double cure. Yes, his body has been cured, but what of his soul? And Jesus says to him, See, you have been made well. Your body has been cured. But what about your soul? Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Now, some want to say, Well, see, the man had sinned once, and look at what he got for it. 38 years of being lame. So he better not sin again, because then he's going to get something worse. But here, 
Jesus is saying, do not go on sinning. It is a present tense. It is something active, not something that he might do one time in the future. And so Jesus is saying, you need to pursue holiness. You need to seek God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. And what is at stake? Lest a worse thing come upon you. Now, we can easily read that, but you think, what would be worse than 38 years of being lame, dependent on the kindness of others? What would be worse? Death? Judgment? Jesus speaking in the realm of sin. What does every sin deserve? The wrath and curse of God. This man had been freed from the effect of the curse upon the world the lameness that he had suffered for 38 years. But Jesus is saying, you've been made well, but what of your soul? This is where Jesus' focus was. This was his desire, and he searches this man out, that he might complete that ministry to him, that he might say to him, you are to seek God. Not to seek sin, not to think, well, I'm well now. I can go and do whatever I want. <laughs> You've been given your health, your strength. How then will you serve the Lord who has shown such mercy and kindness to you? Will you pursue sin or will you pursue God? This man is confronted. And Jesus has set before him that need to turn from sin and to turn to God. And we think today of how many people would be happy to get healing, would be happy to get riches, would be happy to get a wonderful job, anything from God. And then they go their own way. And they show no thanks or mercy. Yes, they may cry out when they have a need, when there's a desperation, God help me. And then when they find relief, they forget. Perhaps you've known someone that I have who was nearly in a car accident. And they they say, God, if you get me out, I'll go to church forever. How long did that last? It lasted about two weeks. You see, our external circumstances can change for the better. But the question is, where is the heart oriented? So many people want to see God as, God, you're up there. You can do things. Do this for me. I need this. I want this. And then they get it and they go their own way. It's a sin against the kindness of God. And Jesus warns this man who has, has received this kindness, this mercy of God. See, you've been made whole. You've been made well. Don't go on sinning. Or the judgment of God will come upon you. It is worse than 38 years of being paralyzed. It is an address to the man's heart. What does he treasure? Does he treasure his circumstances and now that he has been made well he may rejoice? Or will he say, this needs to draw me to God. There was a response already. He was in the temple. Jesus is saying to him, 
Is this where you will remain? Is this where you will acknowledge that it is God who has made you, has sustained you, cares for you, has healed you, that he is to be your life, your hope, your joy? Because this is the ultimate question for this man, for all of us. How many people will say to God, if you give me this or that or the next thing, I will serve you. How many people can say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I worship him? See, there is a difference in Job's heart and the heart of so many others. And here's a challenge to us as we come before God. Do we say, God, I need this, I need that, I need the next thing. God, give it to me. And we receive something and then we go our way. And we ignore the one who has blessed us. But we must trust in the Lord. For our souls, first of all. That Jesus is demonstrating his power, his authority. His freedom to do good, even on the Sabbath. We will see that, that the confrontation comes to Jesus. And there will be further explanation of Jesus' claim. But here he demonstrates the power of God. But he doesn't say, isn't it wonderful, the great things I can do? He asks the question, well, this man, where is your heart? Will you love sin or will you love God? And we are challenged with the same. We may know hard circumstances, even desperate circumstances. Do we say, well, if God doesn't give me what I want, forget it? Forget him? Do we say, Lord, you have given your son you have provided a sacrifice that my soul is made clean. That I have in Jesus eternal life. And if I suffer on the earth for 40 or 38, 48, however many years, I have life. Eternal life. And therefore I will not love sin. I will not seek to use God, but I will worship him as he has shown his grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, as we desire things in this life, as we desire good things in life, of health, of strength, of opportunity, of success. O oh Lord, we pray that we may never make such things the measure of our relationship to you, and that even when you are gracious and grant to us wonderful success, wonderful healing, Lord, may we never forget you. May we never turn aside, but may